Take your Bible, turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 20. Everybody got your Bible? I know some of you have it memorized, right? If you don't have the book, open your phone. Turn to it on your phone. I don't care what you look at as long as you look at it. But you need to be looking at it because you don't need to, uh, I might say something wrong. You don't, don't, don't take my word for it. You need to be looking at the word. I'm going to read the scripture tonight, and then we're going to talk about it. Is that fair? So for all, that is, uh, all those that are in the building, would you stand up in honor of reading God's words? For all of you who are walking online, watching online, Unless you're in your car, stand up in honor of reading God's Word. And let's look at what God's Word says together. Verse number 7, Acts 20, verse number 7. Now on the first day of the week, what's, what day is that? Sunday. When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Can I get an amen? I wasn't the first long-winded preacher, just letting y'all know that. Verse number 8. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Aristicus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. I mean, you think that'd be the end of the service. I, I, I guarantee you, if I was preaching and someone just died right in the middle of the service, I'd dismiss. But I'm not sure that uh, you can put Paul into that same category. He had more faith than I have. But verse 10 says, But Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, and said, Do not trouble yourself for his life, is in him. And when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while. Come on, the sermon went till midnight, but now it says, even till daybreak. Can I get an amen? Oh, I, I got a few mumbles. I'm not sure I got a good hearty amen on that one. He departed, and they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted that means they were comforted a great deal you may sit down wherever you're watching from when I come to this particular passage it's kind of just to the point you see in this passage that they were meeting together but something happened it was the Lord's day it was their custom that they would uh, get together and have uh, what, now don't, don't get the wrong terminology, but in their terminology they would call it a love feast. We would call it a fellowship meal where everyone would uh, bring something to it. Um, anybody know what I mean when I say a potluck? And, and, and there's a, an opportunity where people would come. Now, they didn't have buildings like we have. They, they would have uh, sometimes they would meet together in, in a common school like they did at Corinth. Sometimes they would meet together in, in a public building, but most of the time they would meet from house to house. That's all they had. So in this particular place, uh, they, they met on the third story of a home. And that's really where the most poor people would live. You understand that heat goes up. Now, that may be good uh, during the cold weather time, but, but uh, upstairs they would have windows. Now, they didn't have glass, but they would have lattice. Y'all know what I mean when I say lattice. And, and that way they would keep the birds out, but it would have an opportunity for the wind to come through. Now, it was hinged on that point to where if you wanted to open it up, you would just basically open up the lattice, put a stick in it, and you could be there. But we do not know if it was opened up or not. 
But this is the place where someone was sitting. Now, let's look at this group. If you look at the beginning of Acts 20, there's a group of seven men that are mentioned. Uh, let's, let's look at them together. Um, verse number four. Uh, so Pater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Aristarchus, uh, Secundus of Thessalonians, if I'm mispronouncing these, you just forgive me. Gaius of Derby, Timothy, uh, Tachias, uh, Tromephius, uh, or Trophimius of Asia. These men were going ahead waiting for us at Troas. So that means Paul, the us, is Luke. Before, when he wrote this, he's always talking about they. But when you get to verse 5 here, he uses the word us. Verse 6, he uses the word we. So seven men, as well as uh, Luke and Paul. Now, how many of you know the 12 uh, apostles, the disciples, right? And, and that Jesus had, his 12 disciples. But they're scattered all over. But in this particular area, Paul had his seven. And, and they, over particular points of time, they've come together. Now, there is always others who would come and go. Apollos, he spent most of his ministry at Corinth. When we get to a chapter... Um, is it 18? Uh, Paul is at Corinth for 18 months. Now, in that Greek place, in that Greek city, he, the, the gospel is going over all of that place, and there were a lot of young men who were called into the ministry, saved and called into the ministry and working in that area. Then he goes further and goes into um, Ephesus. That's in Asia Minor. And, and while he is there... I love this. Uh, look in chapter 19, in verse number 10. And this continued for two years. So Paul is there in Ephesus, ministering in Ephesus. But don't miss this. Look at the rest of verse 10. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, come on now, 18 months over the Greek providence there in Corinth, going out sharing. And, and Paul talked about this. They went, um, they met publicly, but then he also says from house to house. Now he is in Ephesus, what we would call modern day uh, Turkey. If you look at the book of the Revelation in chapters 2 and chapters 3, there are seven churches that are mentioned there. Those are the seven churches of Asia Minor. They make a little circle. All of those churches were founded during this time frame. Laodicea. All of those churches were, were, had come together, as well as others, not just those seven in, in uh, Revelation 2 3. But Hear this phrase, as they worked together, together, as they went from city to city, many times they would go to the synagogue first, but then they would go into the common places. Um, Paul, when he went to Ephesus as a uh, tent maker, he joined with Priscilla and Aquila there, and, and he began to, uh, as a tent maker, work for his living wasn't supported by anyone else, but not just working there, but, but, but going everywhere in the common places, the markets, any place that he could get together with people. Basically doing what we do in our life. Working, going to common places where people meet, people who have social interests meet together, people who send their kids to the, to the little house schools that they would be at, or social schools. Uh, they had markets, open markets, where they would meet together, get to know people. And as they get, got to know people, lived around people, were kin to people where they would live in communities and cities, houses of, uh, uh, among little community districts, they would meet people and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. 
Come on now. They would meet people and talk to them one-on-one. They didn't always invite. They might say, hey, we're going to have a group of people meeting at, at, at Brother Pete's house. Come over and meet with us. We'll be there on the first day of the week. Something really important we're going to be talking about. But they may just witness to them there. Amazing things were happening. All right, church, listen to me. I hadn't said anything to you you didn't already know. And if you've read the book of Acts, you know that everywhere they went, things were stacked against them. Everywhere they went. Matter of fact, there was a group of Jews that would follow Paul. He would go from one city to the next, and once they found out where he was, those Jews would go there and stir the people up there against the message of Christ. Gentile people. I mean, Ephesus, my goodness, it came against them. Matter of fact, when you get to chapter 19, that's not the first time. That's the second time there. And they, the whole city was in uproar. You know the one time when the, 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 they were going to take uh, Paul, whether it was at Philippi, whether it was at Ephesus, he was beaten, he was thrown in jail in many places, he was stoned in places like Antioch and Derby and Lystra, those places in Galatia. Listen, everywhere they went, circumstances were stacked against them. I'm going to say it again. There was never a place, there was never a time where circumstances were not stacked against them. I, why am I making a big point out of that? That's what the Acts of the Apostles are about. This works, folks. This works. If we're waiting for everything to get smooth, for God to work, it's not going to happen. If you're waiting for everything to be nice and comfortable for you, you're going to be waiting a while. All of us know and understand that the gospel in America is in a dark place. I mean, I'm pausing on purpose because as I look around the room, I mean, you're nodding with me. But the gospel's doing some amazing things in this world. We don't hear about them all so much. But I will tell you, there's some places, how many of you have ever heard of Voice of the Martyrs? Google it if you haven't. Maybe Google it if you have. And read the stories of what's going on in this world through the worst of circumstances. And how the gospel is being magnified in amazing ways. Isn't it funny that the place where the gospel seems to be having the least effect is where we are the most comfortable. During this pandemic that we're in, people want to continue to talk about end times. I don't know when the Lord's coming, but I'm ready for him. As a matter of fact, I've said this a lot recently. I'm trying to live my eternal life right now. I'm going to live forever. I'm not going to live forever down here. Don't want to live forever down here. But I'm going to live forever. And when I take my last breath here, there's not going to be a pause. I'm going to take my first breath there. I'm trying to live my eternal life down here now. And I'm trying to live it with the, with the, the blessing and the the Spirit of God with me. And I'm, gonna, I'm facing things, all of us are facing things we've never faced before. That's okay. If you read the book of Acts and you see the circumstances that they're under, they're not waiting for a good time. They see every day is a good time. Laodicea, if we are in last days, the the. the Laodicean age, the theme of the Laodicean church was that the people thought that they were rich 
and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That looks like us today in America. I am grateful for the church. If you could have knocked me over with a feather, if you had told me in February when we would go through all the things that we've gone through in February, that our giving would be higher than it was in 2019. But it is. Amen? Giving is higher than it was the same time. I asked Laura, I said, I want to know. So she pulled it up through August 18th. Giving is higher this year. By $4,000. Amen? We haven't slipped up, slowed up, woed up. And yet, rich and increased with goods. and We have need of nothing. And we're waiting for things to change. Have y'all heard anybody complain about the circumstances? Have you heard a, about how it's even complained about the circumstances that churches are having to go through and what they're making us go through and all that kind of stuff. Look, we got something from the governor's office this week. And I shared it with the men, some of the men, and um, they're telling us that the governor signed this bill this week, uh, Bill Pandemic Business Safety Act, Senate Bill 359 that we're supposed to put on our doors. Basically says, come in at your own risk. And I think y'all already did that tonight, didn't you? Nobody had to tell you that. You, you've come at your own risk, and for those that are watching online that didn't feel safe to come, you stayed home. And all the way through this, I've said, you just do what you feel led to do. Haven't I? But they're telling us if we need to put that on the door, and if we do put that on that door, that we're protected that we can't be sued if we put it on the door. I don't think anybody here would sue us. But I don't know who's going to come through the door. And we're a very litigious society, and if you don't think somebody's going to sue someone, I don't know what to do. Look, I don't like that. I told Ernie tonight I didn't like it. I told Broadus this morning I didn't like it, didn't I? I, I have no desire to put that on the door. But then we were talking about Romans 13 of doing, doing what the, trying to do the right thing. Look, we cannot wait till everything is the way we want it to be. Circumstances are going to be stacked against us. Why am I saying all this? Why is this story in Acts 20? We've already talked about Peter two weeks ago when we talked about Peter with uh, Tabitha or Dorcas, whatever you want to call her, and the circumstance that he went through. And, and what they saw in Christ was available to Christ's servants. Now, we understand that Peter and Paul were the most symbolic in the New Testament of the work of God. Peter to the Jews, Paul to the Gentiles. And here, he has his group of seven with him and with Luke. And what are they doing? They're meeting together on the Lord's Day. Doing what they normally do. And Paul knows and tells them that this is probably going to be the last time they see him face to face. And in that preacher's heart, he didn't have a sermon, Rick, fixed. He didn't have an outline and notes. And it's in a third story of a house, so there's probably not a whole bunch of people in there. Maybe 12 to 15. It's probably hot. hot. It's probably not the greatest of circumstances. But he's just, can you see the overflow of God coming out in him? And he just talks to them. And they're probably asking questions. He didn't say, take the scripture and, and unroll it to, to Isaiah 53. That's not what he's probably doing. But it, out of his heart, as the Holy Spirit's leading him, he's talking about the things of God. And, and, and he just goes on. And he goes on. And, and I don't believe, you know, this guy who falls out of the window from the third story and is killed, I don't think that he needs, he gets a bad rap. Have y'all ever gotten sleepy in church? 
Are you sleepy tonight? Raise your hand. Stand up, do jumping jacks. Amen? I, I, I used to, pe people said, uh, preacher, do you get mad if somebody goes to sleep? When I was a younger preacher, I used to think, you know, they, doggone it, they should sleep at home. Right? And um, I went to a, a funeral on a Sunday afternoon. And I preached that morning, and, and, and I preached with all my heart. Y'all know that. And, and it can be very taxing when you preach. It's, it's not physically hard, but when you pour emotionally into it, it's, it's very draining from you. And I went to a, a, we had gone to eat lunch, and then I went to this funeral in the afternoon, and I'm sitting there trying to respect this person. I don't have to speak at the funeral. And I'm sitting there, and Bradley, all of a sudden, my head's going. And I begin to pinch myself. Has anybody ever pinched yourself in church? Huh? Uh, there you go. Pinch your husband. My mama used to pinch me until I squealed. I had never got on to anybody else for doing that. I think this guy gets a bad rap for falling asleep in church. My goodness, he, they, they probably began meeting in late afternoon and they had worked all day. They don't get the day off. It's the first day of the week. It's the work week. So they probably worked all day. And, and first opportunity, they came together, they had their meal together, and, and they haven't eaten yet. They haven't eaten the, the, the Lord's Supper yet. So they, it, it, Paul's just talking and talking, and all of a sudden, you hear a, come on. And what happens? You know they probably, what in the world was that? Maybe it made a ruckus or a noise as he began to fall out of the window. Maybe when he began to fall, he went, hey, right? And screamed if he woke up and he's falling third, three stories from the third story. So maybe, maybe 15 to 18 feet, I don't know. But when he hit, whatever he hit, however he hit, that was the end of him. And probably everybody at that point in time, they're running out and they're going down. What do you do in those circumstances? Can I just tell you, circumstances are going to be part of life. And if you say, Pastor, why did God allow this to happen? I think he was telling these seven, and I think he's telling Paul, who knows that he's going to Jerusalem, he's been warned from city to city that if he goes to Jerusalem, he will be bound, put in prison, and yet Paul says, I don't care I'm going because it's the right thing to do. They run down and they find this person dead. You know this is a loved one. The, he, he's an overflow from the super seven that are there. I wonder if young Timothy ran up to him. A young man. Maybe someone he knew. Well, evidently, obviously, it was someone he knew. But, but it says here when Paul gets into this, he runs to him and he pulls an Elisha or Elijah because both of them, when they were met with this same thing, put their body on top of the other one. Maybe Paul didn't know what to do, anything other than that. But hear this and hear this well. In the circumstances, there was something in him that immediately said, Trust God. Believe God. This is what you know. Do it. Paul had never done this before. He wasn't with Peter when Peter did it. He wasn't a follower of Christ when Christ did it. But that did not change him in his personal walk. There are going to be things that we face Difficulties. I can't think of one more difficult than someone dying in front of you and you've got this thing inside you that says, get on top of them and pray and life will come back. But yet Paul was living his life in such a way that he did not see the impossibilities. He saw the possibilities. He did not look at all the things that could make it where it could not happen, but he looked at the opportunity where it could happen. I will tell you, 
He saw the God of the resurrection. He knew the God of the resurrection. As he told the church at Philippi, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable even unto death. He was living his life in such a way and he expected God to be there for him. That's the one thing I'm looking for in us. Not to be bemoaning our circumstances. I, are y'all a little tired of that? But to looking for, looking and, and, and waiting to see a God that's bigger and better. Real quickly. Verse 10, Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him and said, do not trouble yourselves. Basically, it's okay. Guys, it's all right. His life is still in him. God's going to resurrect this guy right here in front of all of us. <laughs> you speak it. God amens it. And the Holy Spirit allows it to happen. In this particular case, it brought life. Are you willing to speak it before you know it so that you can live it in the reality of life? Well, verse 11, and when he had come up, they went upstairs and they broke bread and eaten. That's the Lord's Supper. I wonder what it was like to have Lord's Supper that time. I don't think it was kind of like what we did Sunday. Look, Sunday was our greatest attempt at it. I know it wasn't great, but it was our, I, I just felt in my heart that we needed to remember the blood of, of Christ and the body that was broken for us. I just need to think that we need to keep that at the forefront, that it's not about who we are and what we do. It's about who he is and what he did. But I guarantee you, you just see resurrection and they went up there and they, you knew they knew the stories of Jesus feeding the 5,000. You think they had to, I don't think nobody had to work them up. I believe they had a worship service. I believe something just exploded in their heart. And it set that preacher off again. They did the Lord's Supper, and he got to preaching again, probably with a little bit more vigor than he had before, just sharing the goodness of God. Everybody was bragging on the greatness of God, ready to go forward, ready to just live their lives for the honor and the glory of God, no matter what circumstances. And they did it. He preached until daybreak. There's a place called Ashland College in Ashland, Kentucky. A little university there. You've heard me tell this story before. They went to chapel there. The person in the chapel, it was a, the chapel speaker could not be there that day, so they asked a, a professor to come in and share. But what he did was he got up in front of everybody and told them that his prayer life had not been the way he, it should be. His time in God's Word, letting sins come into his life that he shouldn't let come into his life. Asked for forgiveness from the student body. Told them that he had been teaching lessons out of his notes rather than out of his heart. And those students who had been praying for revival were there. And God's Spirit came upon that place with, through that man's humility. And they began to worship God and people came to, began to come up and confess sin. People lined up, waited in line to get up behind a microphone and confess their sins before everybody there. And they would sing a while and they would pray a while then they would confess a while. And that chapel service lasted seven days, 24 hours a day. Nobody was told they had to go. They just went because they wanted to. Seven days. Couldn't shut it down. Couldn't slow it down. 
This is what I'm telling you. When we get to the place that we find an almighty God, circumstances won't slow us down. How long the preacher preaches won't slow us down. How overflowing our bounty is or how empty we are won't slow us down. Because when we are weak, we become strong. I don't think anybody here wants to stay here till midnight and hear me preach. I really don't think. I think if I was here and I said, I'm going to just stay here and preach. Some of you might do it just to prove a point. But in your heart, you'd be saying, Lord, help him hush, right? But if Jesus Christ walked through that door, you'd stay as long as you physically could. You might have to go to work tomorrow, but you'd be here tomorrow night. I'm telling you, the opportunity today is greater than it's ever been though the circumstances may be worse than it's ever been, at least in my lifetime. And my pump is screaming at me again. Lord, help. Y'all ready for me to pray? Father, we serve at your request. We go when you send. We stay when you prompt. Lord, let us love out of the overflow. Let us give because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Because you have given so much to us. Let us pray because we want to talk to you. Not because we want what comes from your hand. We just want to hold your hand. Father, burden us for what burdens you. Lord, there are people who do not know you as Savior. Father, that burdens me dearly. May we join with you in that prayer. And Lord, I pray that souls will be saved, lives will be touched. Through the ministry of us, through the ministry of you, I should say, through us here in this place. Be with Brian as he preaches Sunday. May your will be done. Father, may when we see impossibilities, when we see circumstances that do not look good, Lord, may we remember that we serve the God of the resurrection. Lord, I think you did it for them to encourage them to keep going forward. Do it within us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.